Welcome, everybody, to episode 28 of Generation Jihad. We took a week off last week, uh, if you probably noticed, or maybe some of you didn't notice. Uh, we did that because, well, we just were kind of spent, I think, or at least I was spent. I didn't really have much to talk about that I wanted to talk about. But we're back this week, and we have a few things that caught our attention that Bill and I uh, want to chat a little bit about. Um, a couple things, right, Bill? We saw um, you know, Bill Rojo, my colleague and comrade, uh, is here once again from FTD. Bill, say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone. What, do you got a cocktail there? What is that? You yeah, know, just taking a sip of water. You caught me at the wrong time. Tom. All right. Okay. You know, actually, it's not a bad idea, uh, according this week, <laughs> given all the craziness going on. Uh, you know, Cocktails but, for afterwards, yes. Yeah. Okay. So we got a couple things we're going to talk about this week. Um, one, you got me. To, uh, I was going to watch The Outpost. Um, finally, I did watch The Outpost after you recommended it to me. I don't generally like watching these movies for a lot of reasons. Um, you and I could talk a little bit about, about that. Sure. I, I did finally watch it. I was planning on watching it. I did finally watch it. It's intense. We'll get into that and what, what the meaning of it, um, you know, long run. We uh, we have the the Taliban the tired Taliban talking point. We're gonna we're gonna talk about a little bit about how the U.S. and now President Trump and everybody keeps talking about how the Taliban is tired of fighting. That's really basically projection by the U.S. and has been for some years. It's really, the U.S. is tired of being in Afghanistan, and so it's sort of projecting that the Taliban. You and I will talk about that. And then the third thing is the Justice Department announced that twenty seven. Uh, former ISIS members or associates, um, what have you, have been repatriated um, from the custody of the Syrian Democratic Forces to U.S. custody, and uh, two a father-son duo are the most recent pair to be repatriated. And we'll talk a little bit about them and some of the interesting details and in their their backgrounds. But let's let's start off, Bill, with the outpost. Um, this is the Jake Tapper film, right? I think Jake Jake Tapper played a role in in getting this made. Yes. Um, and it's why don't you talk a little bit about why don't you set the scene what what's the, what's the movie about um, you know basically set the scene you know the events that t- take place it's obviously an intense combat film I wouldn't recommend it for anybody that doesn't like combat films I don't know how you could like combat films it's all sort of disturbing and intense um, but it's it's a very uh, you know um, heart pounding sort of film and why don't you set the scene a little bit talk about what it's about and the background and we'll talk a little bit about the history of the region and, and Al Qaeda and those types of things. Go for it, Bill. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and Tom, you made the point um, I, before I, I get into the movie. I, I, I am with you 100%. I, I typically don't like to watch movies that are involved in in stuff that we report on. Um, they just usually suck. I mean, I always find something, at least one thing that gets me to, that that, that annoys me. I think of like movies like The Hurt Locker when one Humvee goes outside the wire. Like that would just never happen. I it, it it just doesn't happen. I see a scene like that and I'm like, yeah, forget it. I can't watch this. This they don't know what they're talking about. Um, what did you, th- you think about the outpost compared to your experiences embedded in Afghanistan and yeah. Iraq? How, how, what did you think about it? Did you think it sort of lived up to the? Yeah, exactly. The claim you do, you do think it in. Go, yeah, go I it. do. And this is what I really. Um, there's another uh, the other movie I really liked was. Um, Lone Survivor, right? The the story of the four uh, Mer- Mer- Navy SEALs that uh, got caught up in the mountains in northeastern Afghanistan. I think I believe it was in Kunar. Um, and uh, that was Operation Red Wing. And, you know, only one walked out. Um, uh, the, both of these movies are um, portray the military extremely accurately, how, they, how individuals interact with each other, their gear, how they talk, how, the, you know, all, you know, uh, how actual, co- actual combat looks. Um, so I, you know, I appreciate that if they, if they, I know if a movie is making the effort to do those things right, then it's making a, an effort to get the story right. And, um, the outpost was fantastic. And I think even more so than Lone Survivor because the outpost, and here's the story, um, in, from 2006 to about uh, 2009, the U S military launched counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency operations in um, the two, not just in Kunar and Nordistan province, these are two provinces in northeastern Afghanistan, extremely mountainous, remote locations where bases are set up uh, close to the Pakistani border, where that border is just meaningless. And the Taliban, um, you know, they're Afghan Taliban when they're on one side and Pakistani Taliban on the other. And they're augmented by Al Qaeda and, and other jihadist allied groups and Pakistani groups like Lashkari Taiba and Jaish Muhammad. Um, so, okay, so they, they, they start counterinsurgency operations. The goal is to, you know, to work with the local Afghan people so they would turn on 
uh, the Taliban. Well, that just did not work so well. And, uh, you know, I think that this movie really nice, nicely sums up many of the problems inside of Afghanistan, both past and present. Um, muddled strategy, in this case, muddled, muddled counterinsurgency operations. They, they, they didn't understand the nature of the enemy. They thought that they can, you know, do things like tribal engagement and it would work like it, it worked in Iraq and it just didn't. I mean, they're just two very different cultures, very different people. Um, poor leadership from the, from the top levels of the U.S. military. Um, they stuck combat outposts in these bowls, literally surrounded by mountains, thousands of feet high, and you have this outpost. You know, the, the, the movie does this greatly. You could see the guys are coming into the base and they're looking up and going, oh my goodness, this is, they, they're watching our every move. And of yeah, just to be like, clear, this, this is taking place in 2009. 2009, yes. 2009, and it, it is based on the book by Jake Tapper, The Outpost, right. an untold story of American valor. And he, of course, had a, a hand in a role in, in getting the film produced. Um, and so this is, this is telling the, the story of this one battle and what leads up to it, um, basically, in this remote area of Afghanistan. Now, you and I know about this area or study this area, remote area of Afghanistan. Why don't you give us a little context and background on sort of, you know, just how remote it is and how sort of absurd it is where this where these guys were stationed. Yeah, exactly. And, and by the way, I was covering that. I was writing about this in 2009. This is 11 years later. So it just really, you know, this is a long war. Yeah. So in the case of... Um, it, uh, they, it was a first a provincial reconstruction team base, and then it became a combat outpost. Uh, it was ten miles from the Pakistani border. Border. It's the Hindu Kush, which is some of the most um, difficult, forbidding mountain ranges on uh, mountain range on the planet. Um, and they, you know, they stuck this outpost again. They stuck it in the bottom of a bowl uh, with mountains surrounding it, and there's several villages nearby, and they're trying to engage. You know, again, this is. The terrain, the location of this base is just terrific. And, I, and again, I think they do a, a fantastic job. Um, and this of, is Combat Outpost Keating. It's called, yes. Yeah, so it's, right. it first is called Provincial Reconstruction um, Team at, at Kamdesh. The district is Kamdesh right. in Nor- Noristan province. And um, it, was na- it becomes Combat Outpost Keating after one of the commanders, uh, the, the, one of the previous commanders of the base dies and dies in a, in, in, I'm going to go into this real quick, Tom. He, he dies in a very futile way, which again sort of sums up uh, our entire strategy in, in Afghanistan. There's, there's a scene in the movie. I don't know if you picked up on this, but um, it ultimately it's hard, foretells. It's hard, it's hard not to, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. it ultimately foretells what happens at, at, at Cop Keating, right? So it's na- again, it's named after Captain Keating, um, he's, uh, his units ordered to, they're the ones based obviously at this combat outpost or the outpost as the movie's called. They're ordered to return this heavy truck that's sent to the base for, for no apparent reason other than a commander could send it there. So now they want it back for reasons that are not explained and not given. Um, Keating. And they um, do, and they do a good job of, of showing just how ridiculous it is to get this heavy truck in, yeah. back and forth between the outposts. I mean, it's absurd. The roads are. Yeah, you know, yes. the, the roads can barely be called roads. You know, it, it's a, a very perilous path, and it's just totally, it's totally insane. They, they they make that clear up front that the whole thing is insane, but this this mission in particular is insane. Yeah, right. I mean, why this truck had to go back? Uh, the roads that they put it on, they do it at night. Um, so you know, the, Ke- Keating actually volunteers to drive the truck. I think it's not said, but it, I think he knows just how dangerous this is and doesn't want one of his soldiers to be responsible for driving the truck off the cliff. Well, the truck ultimately falls off the cliff cliff after they after they stop. Like you said, Tom, these roads are just wide enough for a truck this side to go by. And and this is absolutely true. This is how it is. I can never believe that they would send vehicles along these roads and yet they did this all the time. Um, you know, truck falls off the cliff, uh, it explodes and Keating dies. And, and so I'm going to fast. You, let me ask you, let me ask you a question before you move on, Bill, because I want to remember what was the logic of putting this outpost where they did in the first place? Be- they, ne- they don't offer a military rationale for it in the film. Right. But what, what's the, what the heck was the thinking of having this, you know, obviously sitting them there, sitting ducks. What, what was the point of that? The, the point of it is, is that they can be located near Afghan villages where they're going to try to get to, to practice counterinsurgency, right? Try and get the right. I, I get the counterinsurgency to, part, but I don't get the why, why bother with this outpost. I mean, it seems to me if you had to choose between 
let's do let's put this outpost because we need to do counterinsurgency from it and just not do counterinsurgency there. Just don't do counterinsurgency there. Yeah, or, you know, or yeah, they yeah. could have you know or do it somewhere put, else. Put some yeah, uh, put some positions up in the hills. Uh, out, you know, small overlooking positions, or they could have put the base elsewhere. Yeah, they don't really tell us this was again. This is uh, goal goes back to the poor leadership. Uh, they, you know, and ultimately they wanted this base to be close enough to the Afghan people that they could go. Because you remember, everything is is operating within a valley here. There is no, sure. there is no flat ground. So as sure. you said, you're either going to locate in this area. And by the way, getting up on top of the mountains poses problems with resupply and then a sure. whole other whole all all bunch of other issues every time they'd have to engage the Afghans. They'd have to come down several thousand feet. And anyone who, who's ever put on that gear and just walked up a, a moderate hill knows that going up and down these uh, mountains while you could come under fire is extremely, extremely dangerous. So, you know, and so I'm going to fast forward at the end of the at the end of the, the scene of the last scene of the movie. Of course, the, the outpost is half, nearly overrun, um, you know, and you see the you see the the, the survivors, you um, Eight American troops were killed and 26, I believe it was 26, were wounded. Um, and they're being airlifted out on the helicopters. And as you know, one of the last scenes is them looking over and watching combat outpost Keating exploding on fire. So I just thought that that was a really interesting scene that just not only explained, tells you what happens to, to Keating, it foreshadows what happens to Keating, but this is America's mission in Afghanistan in a nutshell, is everything that happened at, um, at Keating has happened in Afghanistan basically writ large. So. so, you know, obviously this takes place in eastern Afghanistan, and we've covered Kunar and Nuristan for a long time because yes. of the Al-Qaeda, because of the Al-Qaeda angle. And just to give listeners a little perspective, one of the things we documented um, that I think a lot of people missed was that Osama bin Laden, you know, ordered a lot of his guys out of northern Pakistan into Kunar and Nuristan and other parts of Afghanistan back in 2009, 2010, really by the middle of 2010. We know that, um, you know, Al Qaeda had a major, major leader there named Farouk al Qatani or known as Farouk al Qatani. Um, who was somebody who was involved in Al Qaeda's external operations, as well as helping the Taliban lead the insurgency? You know, the U.S. government does name him as a terrorist, providing a bunch of details on him and his role in terms of fueling the insurgency and working with the Taliban. Um, we know that the, the Al Qaeda presence in Kunar and Nuristan, we've documented it many times over the years. You've done it more than I have, Bill, just documenting all the individuals who have been located there. And it's striking, you know, you, you messaged me, you got to watch this film. And one of the things you said to me was, but it doesn't say anything about Al-Qaeda, right? In Kunar yeah. and Nuristan. And this is a recurring theme in these films. Um, it's sort of interesting. Now, let's let's separate this into two general parts. Um, one is the general Al-Qaeda presence in Kunar and Nuristan, which we can document easily. And then second of all is sort of, you know, what actually happened in this battle, this incident, you know, mm -hmm. and, and whether or not foreign jihadis or other types of Al-Qaeda types may have been involved. Um, so uh, let's start with the, the, the first part. We know for a fact that Kunar and Nuristan have been Al-Qaeda hotbeds for many years now. Yes. Uh, and, and they were Al-Qaeda hotbeds at the time that this was all going down, right? That's correct, when, yes. Why don't you talk yeah, a guys about like, uh, yeah, yeah, guys like Kari Zia Rahman, who was hunted in both court and Kunar and Nuristan. He's one of these dual-hatted Al-Qaeda Taliban commanders who operated on both sides of the border. The, the Taliban By the way, is he for sure dead? We don't know. The last right, we, we heard, don't. so in 2015, he was reported dead, and then he popped up and said, oh, no, I'm not, and then I haven't heard a peep from him since. Yeah, It's just one of the mysteries, Tom, of one of these guys that they just... You know, they're, they're vampires and sometimes they're ghosts, right? They just go away and you don't see them. And then they pop up at a, at a time when you least expect it. Um, the, the leader of the, the Taliban shadow governor for Nuristan province, he was um, a guy named Dost Muhammad, deeply embedded, uh, in, tied to al-Qaeda. I mean, closely allied with al-Qaeda and, and obviously worked with guys like Farouk al Qatani and Kari Zia Rahman and, and others. You have Lashkari Taiba operating in, in um, Kunar and Nuristan. And then there was a, oh my God, I can't even remember. There's sort of this offshoot, Lashkar or Jamatu Dawa ul Quran, which is a very interesting sort of a, a Salafist group that is closely tied to Lashkari Taiba and Al Qaeda that operates in the area. Um, 
you know, you, if there's even been report, obviously the Pakistani Taliban operate there. They've launched numerous raids across the border. And typically when they do that, they, they work with the Afghan Taliban and work with al-Qaeda when doing this. And uh, even reports of groups like Jaish Muhammad, another Pakistani terror group, state-sponsored terror group that operates in, in, operates in Kunar and Nuristan as well. It's, as you noted, Tom, the, you know, the bin Laden files didn't lie about this, the relocating of personnel. Kunar, um, Newer, I believe it was Kunar, right, was one of the four provinces right. that was Kunar, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, there's just, we got, I could point to reams of evidence of U.S. military raids. Kari Zia Rahman was hunted by the U.S. military um, for, I believe, three or four years before he sort of dropped off the radar. Um, they they would name him. That's how I discovered he was a dual cat had it Al Qaeda Taliban commander because the, that's how the U.S. military defined him. And then when you looked in him to, into what he was doing a little more, it, it just became obvious. So yeah, this is this is you know, and one of the things, the real interesting things that, that um, we uh, we noted very early on in uh, with Kunar and Nuristan, one of the arguments made by um, analysts and individuals within the U.S. military and intelligence services was if the U.S. military, like, so we were conducting these counterinsurgency operations or basically hunkering down on bases in many cases. Um, up in, and, But around 2008, 2009, the idea bubble, I believe that was the time frame, the idea starts bubbling up. Well, if we just, the U.S. military just withdraws from Kunar and Nuristan, the, the whole reason for being for the insurgency will dry up. And the foreign support, you know, the foreigners will have nowhere to go because the locals won't need them to be there. And so that was used as justification to withdraw from these areas. I think it was it was an ex- partially an excuse because individuals recognized that the situation in these provinces and staying at these remote combat outposts that were constantly besieged. And this is what you see in the movie. You don't even get to this battle. Um, it, until you see what, I mean, you must see like at least four or five instances where they start opening fire from the hills. Yeah. Right? They, um, they say, they say very early on, they show the footage of the, the, the Americans at this combat outpost are under fire every, virtually every day. Virtually every day. Yeah. And one of, one of the, you know, figures in the movie says that, says we're under fire, you yeah. know, virtually every yep. day. And then you can tell that they're, they're building up the way the movie builds up. It's building up to this big, you know, huge Taliban raid with hundreds. Now they call it just Taliban. And this is the thing throughout the movie. It's Taliban, 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 which it is a Taliban, but you know, there are good reasons to suspect, as you were saying, that it's not just the Taliban, yeah. right, that was involved in this. Uh, that, you know, you have other parties that fight for the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is currently being whitewashed by a lot of people um, as the U.S. is withdrawing. You know, there there are a lot of other jihadi groups, including Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups that fight for the Taliban, and, you know, including during battles like this. Now, what did you, you find, Bill, when you looked into this a little bit about the specific battle? Yeah, and Tom, you know, like, a, you know, as I said to you earlier, this is my probably only major complaint about this movie and then, by the way it's not it's no reason not to watch it and it's not a deal killer here but and oh by the way i remember talking to jake Tack, jake tapper about this i actually read the draft of this book and what i had said to him back in i believe it was 2009 2010 or 11 when he was writing this and getting it published um i said jake there was an al-qaeda involvement in this and then i could show you this and i sent him some evidence of this and it ultimately it, i you know i think he was so far down the path um, that he wasn't going to change the book, right? Not for this. Um, but r- immediately after the attack, you had, um, the, like you said, the U.S. officials were saying that it was just, you know, tribal Nuristanis who were involved in the attack. But uh, Afghan officials came out right away. They said uh, Arabs and Chechens um, o- o- operated alongside the Taliban. And the, che- um, they, the Chechens thing is always, you know, whenever you yes. talk about Chechens, there's always ambiguity about that, right? So yeah. we're well aware it's, of that, folks. You know, there's ambiguity about because basically anybody who's Russian speaking or any Jahais are Russian speaking, they get immediately called Chechen. They may not be Chechen. They may, you know, obviously, you know, it's a lot of times, you know, so we're well aware of the issues right now. But the bottom line course. is that they're, they're, they identified Uzbeks, Arabs, foreign Jihadis who were in this mix here for the Taliban during this attack. That's yeah, the happens. Chechen thing is, is generally shorthand for someone coming from one of the Soviet republics right they could be tajiks they could be you know again they could be uh, you know anyone from the caucus it doesn't have to be a chechen right? right um so any of those southern former soviet republics um jihadists have a, a wide recruiting base from you know, as you said uzbekistan from tajikistan and sometimes they you know they, again that's it's shorthand for afghans to say chechens because that's just how they think of it but sometimes they are chechens um 
So, uh, you know, and then uh, I, I, you know, I, this movie really jogged my memory, right? We're going back nine, uh, going back 11 years. I got it. Uh, I had an, a very interesting email from an officer. And Tom, I'm going to make a, take a minute to read it sure. because um, I, I think it really, you know, he was an, a U.S. military officer who served, obviously had to be in the Army, um, if, who served in, at Camdesh at one point. So he understood. He, he knew what all this looked like. Um, and keep in mind here, so the U.S. military did describe this as a, a complex attack. It wasn't just like you saw at the beginning of the, uh, the, the, the incidents in the beginning of the movie. They might take a mortar shot here or pot shots from, the, from uh, above, from the ridge line, but it wasn't a, a very complex attack like we saw at, at Kamdesh. And um, so, of course, we're going to have to use, them again, disclaimers on the Chechens. We get it. Um, he was responding to an article where we, I wrote something that Chechens were identified as being involved in, in some battles in, in, um, in Nuristan. And he says, so I'm, it's, this is a quote. It says, it says, as far as Chechens goes, it's not rare for the Taliban to mass foreign fighters on high-level attacks such as the attack on Keating. So uh, I'm going back to me here. He said, to mass foreign fighters at a high-level wow. attacks, right? Okay, back to the, the officer. He said, you usually can tell they're in the area because accuracy of weapon systems goes mm -hmm. up due to their extensive training and combat experience. Okay, I'm going to go back to my voice here. That's by the way, exactly, that's what happened in Benghazi, by the way. Exactly. This is exactly. Benghazi. Yeah, yeah, ahead, right. yeah. And we see this all across multiple theaters, Tom. Yeah. This is it, it, This is the tell. This is how you know it's not just a local uh, yokel that are you know picking up their AKs and 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 popping off some shots when you start seeing these complex attacks using more complicated weapon systems you know you start to go hmm what are we looking at here okay back to him he says you can also note that all that almost all of them have a special weapon other than the AK47 and wear a headband while well, i've never seen a nuristani fighter wear a headband um i'm going to go back to myself here tom i don't know if you recalled if you caught this but in the movie i think they slipped a little here um, there was a spot where the where the three guys walking in and walking they, into the base, yeah, right? And one, one, one of them was wearing a headband, and uh, the American says, "You know, they think they've already won," and he starts shooting at them. Right? Exactly, yeah, right, Tom. I'm right, glad right. you caught that. We yeah. haven't talked before this, folks. Tom, yeah. uh, Tom yeah. and I are, you know, it's it's well, kind of I mean, interesting. We've been doing this for so long now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like you it's, know, right? I mean, so you know, that got in there, and how does that get in there? Okay, yeah. now back to them. He said specifically, what got me was the grenade launcher on the AK-47. This is again, he's referring to. Um, in photographs from a uh, that from a video that I posted at, at this time. These are rarely used by Nuristanis due to the extreme lack of ammunition availability. Their kit also, kits also seem to be of higher quality, where most of the Nuristani fighters use their pockets or common green AK-47 front vests. So again, in the images that I was showing from these videos, you saw you saw a lot more you know kitted out fighters um, uh, that that you know really showed a level of indication that they were far, they were foreign. So uh, it's funny. Tom, I totally forgot about this email that I received from that. And if you're out there, sir, and you're listening, thank you very much for that. You um, you clarified so much on on the 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 Keating attack, combat outpost Keating attack, and you know gave me the ammunition today that I needed to explain why this was more than just a local Nuristani tribal militia attack against a, a, a U.S. outpost. Yeah. So a couple couple things about this, couple follow on points. Before we move on to other movies and comparing this to other movies real quick, um, you know, what struck me watching this movie, of course, is just how erotic, erratic the policymaking on the Afghan war has been. You know, there's the U.S. goes in for coin or counterinsurgency for a while, but then pulls the carpet on that. Watching this movie, you can't possibly come away from this movie thinking we need more coin, right? I mean, yeah. You're not you're not going to yeah. come away from this movie thinking that, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it just it's just striking to me just how erratic the decision making, the policy making has been on this stuff over the years. That there's no consistency in terms of how this stuff goes. And in fact, we were just sitting down to record this, and I I saw this being reported from the army that the army just 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 announced in the last two hours since before we start recording this. so we're recording this on friday october 2nd um, so just that afternoon they announced that the army is discontinuing the uh, both the asymmetric warfare group and the rapid equipping force as the u.s army trans transitions from counterinsurgency operations to a focus on multi-domain operations and large-scale combat operations and I just thought I saw that come across the wire. Just we're sitting down to record this. So I'm just thinking, geez, isn't that exactly tell the story of, you know, a lot of this is that, you know, now one of the things that people don't really realize is 
you know, they think that the U.S. military wants to keep these endless wars or forever wars going, so-called. But you and I have reported for years, no, a lot of people in them want want out. You know, they don't want to be doing counterinsurgency. They don't want to be doing any of this stuff. They want out. They want to they want to pretend that they need to transition to something else to sort of explain away the ongoing failures here. That's the way you and I put it. It's not very charitable to them, but so be it. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm watching this this movie, and I'm just thinking what I kept thinking to myself is. You know, I don't really want to sacrifice American lives for a half-baked sort of strategy or half-baked solution in any war going forward. Um, and that's – that's I just felt for these guys watching this movie thinking, geez, you know, not only was it stupid to put them there where they, they put them, but they put them there for a strategy they didn't even stay, even stay to, they stick to. You know, there was yeah. something that they, they, they basically abandoned. And I'm not even – I mean, believe me, I am not advocating for a coin at this point. I'm just saying, you know, when you look at the overall – pattern of decision making here if you're a guy in the field or if you're somebody or a guy or a gal in the field you know a service member who's fighting right you look at a movie like this and you have a lot of reasons to question your leadership in the military Absolutely. and your political leadership and your military leadership and that comes across to me right did it come across to you bill absolutely uh you know this and but and so yeah and you know i stated this earlier this movie really exposes the the, the poor leadership that we've had throughout the war in Afghanistan and in, in other theaters as well. At times, we, at, you know, we've had moments of good leadership, but it's really surrounded by bad leadership, and that's how we get into these spots. As far as disbanding the uh, – and by the way, Tom, you're, you're, you blindsided me with that one. I did not catch that. Well, it just, Look, it just came out. I mean, literally, yeah, it's just, yeah. just, just making rounds on Twitter <laughs> now with some reporters and stuff, and I saw it come across the wire. So, yeah, I mean – It's, it's amazing. You know, and, you know, so, you again, you watch this movie, and you – say to yourself why the hell would we ever want to fight counterinsurgency um or do a you know practice asymmetrical warfare don't we should not confuse um counterinsurgency or asymmetric warfare with the bad application of count of uh counterinsurgency and asymmetric warfare what we've seen in afghanistan particularly i think of racket was done very well we just never saw it through um but in afghanistan it's been applied very poorly, and that's why you have movies like The Outpost. That's why you had eight Americans killed and 26 wounded in Camdash or in um, Wana. You had actually more. I believe there was 25 killed, and, and there was an even a bigger um, attack on American forces. They were surrounded and almost overrun as well. That was in neighboring Kunar province about a year earlier. So think about it. That happened a year earlier and no one did anything about it, right? They just kept plowing. They just tried to apply a bad counterinsurgency strategy in a bad, um, in a bad situation and in, in, in a terrain that really didn't support it. You had to look at the terrain in Kunar and Noristan and say to yourself, this isn't, we need to figure out another way how to fight this war. We just can't put these blanket solutions, what worked in, you know, in Baghdad or in Anbar province or in Nineveh province or Salahuddin may not work in Kunar and Nuristan and, and, and other provinces, mountainous provinces, remote areas with insular people who have significant and historical ties to foreign jihadists. Yeah, and this area of Afghanistan is well known to have a sort of extremist or radical bent that, you know, Salafism, an extreme form of Islam, or extreme form of even of Salafism took root in some of these areas a while ago. Uh, so this is not this is not an area where it was going to be easy, I think, to to do coin just be, beyond the geography of the situation. Yeah, right. The human the human terrain of it is is a, is a rough go. Absolutely, uh, Tom. I yeah. could not agree more. That was a that's and that's, you know, I think I made that point earlier. Right. We didn't understand the people that we were dealing with. Right. And that was perfect. You know, when you mix bad terrain, you know, the, the, the forbidding ter terrain with a failure to understand the people and, and how um radicalized they are and sympathetic to not just the Taliban, but to other foreign terrorist groups like Al Qaeda. You, you try to get into that mix. It's, that's just a recipe for failure. And um, that's what we see in the outpost. So now this movie is similar to other movies in a couple different ways. Um, again, you and I both recommend it and say it's excellent. Go, should go, people should go watch it. If you, if you can stomach the sort of thing, it is yes. intense, you know, um, the, um, it's similar to other movies. You know, a couple of thoughts came to mind. The first one, before we move to the, back to the Al-Qaeda angle for a second, one of the things that came to mind was that 
you know, when you watch a movie like this as an American, and you and I are proud Americans, right? And we say that, and that's part of, there's some animosity for us in different quarters because we are Americans, right? We're not, we're not part of the blame America first crowd. You know, we, we, we're proud Americans, despite all the problems we have right now as a country. That's what we are, you know? But as an American, you watch a movie like this and you think, geez, you know, you know, why the heck would I want to send other Americans into these places where we can't tell the good guys from the bad guys, you know, and when you see that, you know, that and, and sort of put them in the middle of the of tough terrain like this. But again, both geography and human terrain. And it's similar to 13 Hours, the movie on Benghazi. It's the same thing when you watch that friend of friend of ours said, you know, seeing it, you know, came out of that and was thinking, you know, geez, um, you know, you watch that and you think, you know, we didn't know we couldn't tell the good guys from the bad. And we had Sarah Carlson on an earlier episode of the podcast who said basically that. Right. I mean, she said that that was one of the problems they ran into. You know, yeah, or, or she also said basically even when we could tell the difference or right. we suspected we had the difference, we didn't have the wherewithal to do anything about it for, for right. diplomatic and political reasons. Right. Now, this is, I'm going to say something that's a little – maybe a little controversial, a little harsh now on this, right? So you and I, we don't really fit into any of the buckets um, in Washington, the policy buckets or the ideological buckets for a lot of reasons other than being proud Americans. You know, we don't – I don't, you know, you have all these different isms or camps and, or, and we just don't really fit into a, any of them, I would say. Um, you know, uh, maybe other people would disagree with that. I don't, I don't really give a shit, as you know. Uh, but but we don't really fit in any of these buckets. And one of the reasons is so, you know, there we have, we've dealt with people who are sort of naive interventionists, right? As I would call them. People who just sure. sort of want to intervene in these countries and sort of, um, you know, think that just getting the America involved and the U.S. military involved, you know, we can make the situation better and it'll be a better outcome. And, and you and I have sort of recoiled from that for years. You know, we have not actually advocated for U.S. military to go in a lot of different areas that they're in, you know, Libya being one of them. I don't, you know, we report on what happens in Libya, but I didn't think that we had a good understanding of Libyan society. You know, Syria, you and I are both skeptical of doing more in Syria because, you know, yes, it's a nightmare. I'm, you know, we're not on the Assad apologist side. Uh, but we're not, you know, we didn't whitewash the insurgency either. There's some the nasty characters there um, in Syria. Um, but, you know, basically we we have a much more skeptical take on the U.S. military's ability to shape events and do things in these different countries for a different reason than some of the Blame America folks have. Our reason is that a lot of times we don't know who these actors are. We don't know what we're doing, right? I mean, that's that's the key thing here that stands out in a movie like The Outpost. A lot of times they don't know, you don't really know who you're dealing with or what you're doing. And it's a very difficult task. And um, so, you know, you can see a movie like this could be used also, you know, obviously I think it's, you know, sort of what we call naive or I call naive interventionism is sort of discredited. Um, You know, on the other hand, you also have ignorant isolationists, you know, who would basically look at something like this and just say, see, you know, the Taliban, you know, we shouldn't be worried about the Taliban at all. Shouldn't be thinking about the Taliban as our enemy at all. And we should just get out. Right. Um, I, you know, I think as you and I've said, I think the time is up in Afghanistan, so we're not advocating for continued no. presence necessarily. Uh, but, um, but that wasn't true in the past. You know, I mean, the Taliban is a nasty actor that's allied with Al Qaeda to this day and is our enemy, despite all the confusion and Taliban apology that's crept up. And I just, I just watched a movie like this and I just was thinking, boy, you know, you could see different ideologues seizing on this and that. And a lot of times the messy reality is just that. It's just a complex, messy, messy reality. I don't know. It's sort of my own little diatribe. What do you think about that? Bill? No, no, Tom, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, the, the I'm okay with, you know, look, we had interest to get involved in Afghanistan, to invade Afghanistan. And we're not going to rehash all of this here. We had very real interest after 9-11 to yeah. pursue and no, and nobody, nobody wanted to be in Afghanistan right. in 2001. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, don't think, I don't think anybody wants to be in Afghanistan now. I, can't, I, right. I haven't known anybody that actually wants to have a U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. It's purely just about the jihadi threat, yeah. which some people will say, you know, don't worry about it and just walk away from it. And I would say, well, you know, I have a little bit of a different take than that, but I believe me, but that's not to endorse, you know, a broad mission there or ongoing mission there. You know, I, I think there are downsides of withdrawing. You and I have laid those out from Afghanistan, but by the same token, you watch a movie like this and it re- does reinforce our skepticism of the whole thing, right? Yeah. I mean, that's my point, you know? Yeah, the, and the point, you know, it's well taken and it's just, we can't get involved in more wars, you know, if we want to advocate, involve, you know, involving going to war with this country or that country, when we can't even deal with, the Taliban. We can't even deal with Iran and Iraq. And, um, you know, we don't have the willpower. You know, I think a big, pro- another big problem in all this, besides 
um, poor military leadership. I mean, I think our obviously our political leadership has been feckless. So pulling the plug on the, the you know, look, if you're going to commit to the Afghan surge, then go for it. Right. And you have to commit to that. That's got to be at, you got to at least give it a decade. Right. You can't do a two year counterinsurgency, less than two year counterinsurgency. Or 18 where, months even. Yeah. You know I mean? Several thousand American troops are killed and tens of probably over tens of thousand wounded. Um, grievously, many grievously in, in those instances. That's just... Now, that's, some would say, Bill, some would say in the counterfactual, and I don't, I don't really want to go down the coin rabbit hole here because I'm just not... <laughs> you know, it's so yeah. tiring, you know? But uh, some would say the counterfactual world, it wasn't going to work anyway, so don't well, bother with sticking with coin for the long run. Yeah, that's, that, right. that's so, what so, critics would say, you know? So then don't do it. I mean, you know... So don't do it do in the it, first place then, right? Or don't do it. I, I This is where I don't trust our leadership anymore. Right. I don't... And, you know, s- as soon as... Um, Obama made it clear to, and I want to really rehash this whole debate, but as soon as Obama made it clear to President, or to General Petraeus that, thank God, not to President Petraeus, um, General Petraeus that, uh, that it was, he was going to pull the plug on it in 18 months, the military should have just stood up and said, we cannot do this, we should not do this, this is not, you know, this is unethical, we're exposing our troops to a, to a strategy that'll fail, but what did our military leadership they do? They said, sure, let's go with that, and hopefully we could show some success and change his mind, and that's, that to me, that is, that's not leadership, um, and, and that's what, you know, frightens me about all of this, about the future U.S. involvements. Um, you had basically generals that signed up for something because they either thought that they could manipulate a president um, going forward or that it was in their best interest politically for them to get their next star or their next command to, to, to agree to bad policy. I'll leave it at that, Tom. That's my rant. That's over. Yeah, no, it's, it's an insidious sort of dynamic here. I mean, I think the point is, you know, if, if the president doesn't as commander in chief doesn't think that the U S should be in a place like, you know, you now have two presidents in a row who have been calling for an end to the American military involvement in Afghanistan. You know, I kind of chuckle a little bit about these people we see on social media and Twitter and everything. And, you know, they, 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 you see some of this snarky stuff. Right. And I, I think to myself, you know, if you're on the left, then you should be mad with Obama for not getting totally out. Right. Yeah. Cause that's, that's the guy who's the decision maker, not Bill Rocio. Not Tom Jocelyn, right? Not those damn neocons. That's one of those isms. It's total <laughs> nonsense that you and I have seen over the years, right? Yeah. That's total garbage, by the way, folks. Uh, but you know, you also have because um, we're far from that. Uh, but then you also have, you know, if you're a Trumpist, if you're you know a fan of President Trump who's running on ending the forever wars and forever. Well, we're sitting here in 2020. He's had three and a half years. Yeah. You know, he can leave. he can leave. Yeah, I mean, you know, don't. You know, this is this is how poisonous. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole again of the endless wars, the forever wars rhetoric. But this is how how weird this is politically, right? These people that that are politically sort of, you know, yeah, you know, go for the, you know, end the forever wars, end the endless wars. I'm like, okay, uh, you know, who who has the power to do that, right? It's not it's not my buddy Bill and myself in New York and New Jersey, right? We don't have any power, right? No, <laughs> We're recording a podcast, you know, so. Uh, but but by the same token, when you look at this stuff, you know the other part of all this that 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 sort of bothers me still is just the the, the Taliban whitewashing and apologia. I mean, you know, I look at this movie and this segues to the, another another aspect of this movie that's similar to other movies, and I just think watching this movie, how America really has never gotten a good accurate understanding of who we're even fighting throughout all these wars. You know, the movie in the movie sometimes in the outpost you hear some of the guys say, you know, back home. Americans don't care about any of this. They only care about, you know, Paris Hilton or something like that, whoever right, the right. name was yeah. at the time. You know, I think that's probably true. You know, I think that's probably, you know, but, you know, that's probably true. But here's the thing, right? I mean, there are a lot of leaders or a lot of people who've been involved in these war efforts who didn't really care enough to learn about the enemies either or understand what they were what they were doing, you know? Um, and, you know, I look at this movie and you document there is some evidence of, you know, sort of Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda affiliated fighters being involved in this this attack. I look at 13 hours on Benghazi, you know, we talked about that in the past, about how you can see the obvious links to Al-Qaeda there. You know, the, the, Senate, the Democrats on the Senate Intelligence Committee, when they control the Senate, the Democrats on the Senate Intelligence Committee released a report saying members of AQAP, you know, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, you know, Ansar Sharia, which subsequently we were proven right and had all sorts of ties to Al-Qaeda, and the Muhammad Jamal group, which was led by Muhammad Jamal, the subordinate Diamond al-Zawahiri, they were all in, in part of this attack on Benghazi, you know? And you go to 13 Hours, which is a good movie. I watched that movie too, um, you know, and of course that gets into a little bit of the political firestorm, which I never was all that interested in the politics of it. I was only interested in the, sort of the details of it. But 
Um, you get to that movie, there's, there's no mention of Al-Qaeda in that movie either. Um, you go to Black Hawk Down, where you have evidence you can see in the 9-11 Commission report. You can see in district court filings that Al-Qaeda trained the militiamen who were involved in that incident. And, and some of the Al-Qaeda guys even boasted of taking part in it. There's no mention of Al-Qaeda in Black Hawk Down, which was arguably the first time the U.S. Came, uh, military came face-to-face -face with Al-Qaeda. Um, it's sort of a weird dynamic in all this, that despite all the attention on terrorism and jihadism and, and everything through the years, you can see these obvious holes in these stories that they help explain or illuminate who we're actually fighting. And I don't, I don't know that anybody even cares. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Tom. I'm going to give you one more movie, and that was, and I love the movie, too. Uh, you know, that was Lone Survivor. Um, we, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda was involved in that, uh, that attack. They were uh, operating in the area. We killed the commander of this group, and, and um, but it's completely set aside in that movie. Again, it's just, it, it, I, you see this stuff, and again, this is why I don't want to watch it, because I don't want to come away with that bad taste in my mouth. Not that watching these, you know, extremely gritty and, and, um, very violent and very, and very, you know, soul crushing when you see what our servicemen go through, the combat that they go through. You know, it's bad enough to have to watch that and then to, to see at the end that, you know, they just they just missed that key point that would have, you know, made, instead, you know, it, this is like a triple plus, but it could have been a grand slam. You know what I mean? If they just gotten that one part right. So. All right. So I, I think this is just to circle back before we move on. This, this gets to the point I, I said earlier where you and I don't really fit into any of the buckets, the, the sort of ideological or political buckets on these issues, right? Because you can listen to us and you can get all the skepticism and criticism of like the war in Afghanistan, which we've, I think, analytically in some ways have led the way on. You did with your mapping of what the Taliban was contesting and trolling, which drew into question the whole effort uh, years yeah. years before anybody else was really hip to, you know, that it wasn't working, the U.S. was doing wasn't working. Um, and there are various other ways we've critiqued the war effort. But by the same token, we don't fall down this trap of saying, well, yeah, but don't worry about the Taliban anyway, and don't worry about the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. You know, it's sort of, it just, it leaves us in sort of this weird, awkward, I think, sort of state of not really having a base of, of, uh, of, of opinion that would really kind of get what we're about, I would say. I don't know if you, you feel the same way or think the oh, same way. But, you know. Tom, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a term for this. We're in no man's land. Yeah. I mean, we are literally, you know, we we just do not conform to the with the herd, any of the herds out there, and it just makes us outsiders. Look, you, you know, you and I jokingly refer to the Long Word Journal as the minority report. Um we are, and it's um, we're we're the minority report that's right, but um, and I, I stand by that. Um, but uh, it's a very awkward position to be in, and it's a very uh, often very frustrating position to be in. So this moves on to the second topic, which is the tired Taliban. Um, yeah. We've been hearing about the tired Taliban now. When was the first? You know, this is something you wrote up. You kind of had to write this up, and I, I kind of winced when you said you were going to write this up. I'm like, oh man, you know, we just had to hear this so many times now. I mean, it's just like ridiculous, you know. It, so there's this talking point from the U.S. in the U.S. and you you document it. It's politicians, military officials, reporters you hear this all the time. The Taliban's just tired. They want to stop fighting. And of course, there's literally no evidence on the battlefield. They're tired of fighting. You know, I mean, they they keep fighting constantly. You know, launching even launching a massive operations against the Afghan government after the U.S. agreed to this deal in Doha with uh, the Taliban. Um, so, you know, why don't you walk us through that a little bit, Bill, with the tired Taliban, it's a tired Taliban talking point, right? It's a tired talking point, really. It sure is, Tom. And look, um, I've contemplated this, uh, I'd like to, um, uh, create a, like an Instagram, uh, uh, account for, to just to, um, generate war on terror memes. And this would be in my top three. Um, probably the other would be obviously the 50 to 100 Al Qaeda, and maybe we get Ansar Sharia is not Al Qaeda, and Ansar Dean not Al Qaeda, those type of things. I mean, it's just the, these are evergreen memes. So I first started hearing this in 2014. 2000, I'm sorry, 2004, not 2014. That is yeah. 16 years ago the Taliban was tired. That's, that showed up. Um, we heard well, could, started, they, could they be in like the you know late stages of exhaustion by now then if they were tired in 2004 I mean where how far down the tired path are we yeah. are they are they sleepwalking at this point are it, they you know what it, what's going on I mean this is you know they got to be really tired now if they were tired in 2004 my god I mean my know. goodness Tom they must be narcoleptics or something yeah. I don't know but they they I mean after 16 years of being really tired maybe they got their rest and, and they're not tired anymore we started hearing this again in 2009 they've been taking naps along the way maybe that's uh, a secret to the Taliban success that's it. you know 
Just yeah, slip back naps. across the border. The, the napping and the jotties. We could have a whole subsection along with the napping <laughs> jotties, you know? Yeah, look, when you have a safe haven in, in Pakistan and to a lesser, lesser extent into Iran, um, sure, maybe you go across the border, you catch your nap, and, and, and then Kunar, you come back Kunar, Kunar, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, and within large, lo- yeah. we could we could name a lot yeah. other areas in, in Afghanistan where they're probably taking taking some slumbers. But if they're taking a slumber in Afghanistan... Then it just goes there. Then if they're snapping, what is the Afghan military doing? They yeah. must just so this, be. So it started in 2004. And how many times you've been here? You've documented. So recently I, it was President Trump said it most recently, right? right. He repeated the point, right? And President Trump, you know, he wants to have Afghanistan. Uh, he's critical of the whole thing. He thinks the whole thing is a, a lost effort, which, you know, it's difficult to dispute that, <laughs> I would yeah. say. Um, we don't agree with his path out, but, you know, we understand the desire to get out. But. So he, but he just starts repeating these talking points because they're just look, they're just grasping for whatever they can say, right, to justify losing, basically. Exactly. Look, and he said the same thing a year ago. So maybe he just forgot about that, but I don't because I kind of document these things. Um, you know. So again, they just another nap. I'm not sure whatever happened here. You know. So when it was the U.S. started hit, you know, when the surge, you know, sort of getting close to post surge, you started seeing this this tired Taliban meme. Um, start popping back up, you know, you, you did. Um, here's a, here's one guardian reported. This is a quote, both the West and the Taliban are tired now and keen to move towards a resolution. What year was that? That was 2011. Um, secretary of state, Hillary Clinton in 2011, we have broken the Taliban's momentum. That's one of our favorites. We Um, we debunked that one when that that was the talking point that came out of the U S military and policy circles about the momentum plug. And so we, we just, we we debunked that based on the U S military's own data. You know, I love that that, Tom, you know, you, you, you put your, um, your expertise with the statistics, numbers numbers and statistics all that was perfect. I love it. I still go back and chuckle at that one. Um, uh, president Obama reportedly, said they again and Taliban's momentum was broken. He said that, I'm sorry, in 2012 in the State of Union dress. Again, folks, Taliban's momentum was broken eight years ago. This is 2020. Um, in 2000, in uh, September 2012, 12, Secretary of Defense uh, Leon Panetta, he claimed that the green on blue attacks, these are those insider attacks where the Taliban get Afghan soldiers to turn on, um, on American and coalition forces. He said that was evidence of the last gasp of, of the Taliban. Ugh. Last gasp is, is in quotes, by the way. That's what he yeah, used. I know. Um, we, look, and by the way, that one really just went, we, we, got, we got so worked up over that one that we actually commissioned a cartoon the cartoon, um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so it is basically you could go look at look for last gasp of the dying Taliban in Long War Journal. You'll see Panetta reading um, the big pop up book of defense, and he's saying, "Boys and girls, the twas the last gasp of the big bad Taliban insurgency." And then he opens the next page, and you get all the pop up Taliban, you know, cartoon characters with AK forty sevens. It's just it's classic. I love it. Maybe maybe some people don't get it, but you know, again. Eight yeah, years later. you know the thing about Here that cartoon are. too is we don't even dislike Panetta, right? I mean, no, I seems, no, Panetta, I, I, of, yeah, Panetta I, most of the time seems to be a fairly. I mean, when it comes to the look, DC type, seems to be a straight shooter. So he, you know. I, I thought he was a very good Secretary of Defense, and I thought he was a very good director of the CIA. Uh, the CIA. Look, he said some things, and I think this is sort of a result of the bureaucracy, the fifty to a hundred, and the dying gas, last gasp of the Taliban. But this is stuff that sort of trickles up, you know, to these to the. I mean, I don't expect. You know, Mr. Panetta to be looking at this like you or I, but the real disgrace in all this is the people that are below him should be, and they should know this, and they should know not to say things like "last gasp of the dying Taliban" and 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 tired Taliban and 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 momentum is broken. Um, you know, the other, I, the other one, the other one. Now we got you're going to hear a lot of, and we've already seen some of this is. Um, the uh, you know the Taliban is just a national jihadist movement, and the success of the diplomacy with America is something to be emulated with other jihadist groups. I mean, yeah, I mean you can unpack that argument. We're going to hear you're already hearing it. You're going to hear it more, and you can unpack that one how inaccurate that is in many different ways. Uh, you know that's not just not not true. First of all, the, the, there's no evidence that diplomacy so far has been a success. Uh, and second of all, the idea that the Taliban is purely nationalist is a mindless talking point that's rebutted by a lot of evidence. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, by its own own statements, even yeah. where they talk about you know 
providing leadership to the global UMA and when they complain about this and that and how the UMA should be united to wage jihad or even videos, Tom, where they're encouraging jihad, foreign jihadists to come to, they slip every once in a while. Um, or how about even accepting uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri's uh, oath of allegiance publicly? I mean, you know, so again, we could, we could, we can and probably have done whole shows on that. Um, you know, look, and so to May 2015, uh, I just sorry to go on with this. General Campbell says that the, the Taliban are tired from fighting for, for 14 years and want to get on with their lives. General Cam- Kander, then it was the time of the U.S. I think General leader. Campbell wanted to get on with his life. Yeah, <laughs> the I, I did, have, you know? exactly, exactly. Yeah. He, yeah, he was the leader of U.S. forces in Afghanistan at the time. Um, you know, uh, so uh, again, on and on and on. Dana, okay, 2018, Dana White said, called the Taliban desperate in 2018. I, you know, Tom, it's just old. They're not, you know, how could they, again, I'm repeating myself here. How can they be retired for 14 plus years? It's, or, I'm sorry, 16 years because it was 2004. It's, um, it's so long ago. My math is terrible. It's, I'm tired of hearing it and you should be tired too. Yep. Well, on that cheery note for the <laughs> Afga- Afghanistan part of the podcast, we got another story here, which is that the Department of Justice announced that 27 ISIS fighters or associates members have been repatriated from the Syrian Democratic Forces to the U.S. And it was interesting. We were looking through just sort of what's in the public filings for two of them. Uh, the two most recent uh, jihadis to be repatriated are Imran and Jihad Ali. Um, this is a father and son. Imran is 53 years old. He's born in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Jihad 19 is born in New York. They're both American citizens. And it caught my attention looking through this, uh, Bill. They, they, according this is according now to what is in the charges against them and in, in the, these legal filings, according to the FBI and, and Department of Justice, that um, Imran Ali and his family moved to Syria in March 2015. They traveled to Syria. Um, that both Imran and Jihad then received military and religious training and served as fighters for ISIS. And then Imran served in various other roles. He basically at one point uh, sort of uh, basically gets a medical leave and starts doing sort of more residential type stuff for them. Um, and they and ultimately they surrender to the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces near Baghouz in March 2019. So basically a four-year run. They surrender after about four years. You know, Baghouz in Syria, that was sort of the last stand for the, the ISIS caliphate, the last piece of territory that they held on to as a, a formal piece of the so-called caliphate. Um, what was interesting to me about this was you could see right around the time that Imran um, and his family moved to Syria to join ISIS, you can see again, according to these allegations, that in 2014 or around that time, he's listening to Anwar al yeah. lectures. lectures. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's around that same time he, he learns that his wife's family had relocated to Syria and he sort of reaches out to them and gets some help for figuring out how to get there. And they travel from Brazil and Turkey to get into Syria. Um, and when they get into Syria, that they after they receive their Sharia training and training in Islamic law, the, he's then assigned to the Amr al Aki battalion uh, and and took part in at least one raid, according to what he admitted. Now, the Amr al Aki connection here is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, we just passed the 10 year anniversary of al Aki's death in the U.S. drone strike. Again, speaking to how long this all is and how ridiculous this all is, and how that we've been covering for so long. Ridiculous that, you know, just think back, you know, it doesn't, it, ridiculous in the perspective that it doesn't seem that long to me ago that we were talking about Alaki and the raid on him and, you know, the drone strike and his importance and all that stuff. And and yet you can see here again is another example of a guy who, you know, allegedly Alaki played some role in, in his, you know, um, path to be, to, to adopting sort of jihadist beliefs. Now, when it comes to ISIS, uh, realm. This isn't all that rare. We've pointed out numerous times that jihadis um, in the English-speaking world could start off with, you know, listening to Alaki lectures and then ultimately migrate over to the ISIS camp. Alaki, of course, was part of Al Qaeda. He certainly endorsed the Islamic State of Iraq, the predecessor to ISIS, but that was before the big fallout between Baghdadi and Zawahiri and ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, Alaki stuff is was used all throughout ISIS propaganda early on, um, or at least fairly often. Not, I wouldn't say all throughout, but a, a noteworthy number of occasions anyway. Um, we've seen that. We documented some of that. And some of these guys, you know, you see Alaki's ideological footprints or or sort of uh, wording or beliefs or arguments 
come out of the minds of other guys who end up going to join ISIS or declare their allegiance to ISIS. And you see that here in the U.S. You know, the guy, Omar Mateen, who shot up uh, an Orlando LGBT nightclub, allegedly listened to Olaki's lectures along the way before declaring his allegiance to ISIS the night of his attack. You know, the guy in New York and New Jersey laid those pipe bombs. You know, he, you know, had some Olaki inspiration there uh, for sure. Um, San Bernardino couple, remember that attack several years ago um, where they went in and shot up a holiday party. There's evidence that um, you have an Olaki's inspiration there before they gravitated the ISIS camp. And it just goes to show, this is something, you know, I, I, I wrote a chapter about this. I won't belabor this with more examples. There are, there are a lot of examples, uh, but this is, this is a common sort of phenomenon, I think, where we see this. And you see this here, uh, you know, based on these allegations. Here we have another example of Arma Olaki's teachings influencing people along the way, and even if they end up joining ISIS, which, you know, I broke off from Al-Qaeda. And it shows that, you know, sometimes this stuff sort of migrates or evolves in ways that are unexpected even for the people who are involved. Like, I don't think Alaki would have thought that his stuff would be taken up by somebody who ended up, uh, you know, working for an organization that betrayed Al-Qaeda and turned against Al-Qaeda, and yet here we are, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it is fascinating, Tom. That's what, you know, what really struck me when I, I heard about the Enro Alaki links was, my God, you know, just as you said, what, he's been dead for 11 years now? Is that right? Is this all, I'm sorry, nine years. Is it 11 or is it uh, nine years, Tom? I forget. It was a, I can't remember what year he was killed, but it was that well, long Lockie, ago. Lockie was, Lockie was killed 10 years ago. So. Yeah, ten, yeah, so, I mean, yeah. He, his ideas, yeah. and it's it's lived through the internet. Every time his sermons are taken, if they attempt to take them down, they go back up. And, you know, the, the Islamic State, um, you know, again, he was, he was a very senior leader within Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and yet the Islamic State tries to claim him as they, their own. They even created in Syria uh, the Anwar al-Awlaki, Brigade. Well, that's what we just said. The bata- yeah. I don't know, like a battalion. Imran, Imran Ali, this guy, yeah. he joined it. He joined yeah, it in exactly. Syria. He was Which in was- it, yeah. And it's English speaking members yeah. and it, it's, it's really, you know, and apparently they had quite a few of uh, um, English speakers go through this battalion. Several, we've killed several of them. So it's, it's had that, he has had a, a, a major, as you said, a major impact, um, not just on Al Qaeda, but um, really on the Islamic state. And it, it seems that the Americans, particularly that listen to him, seem to gravitate to the Islamic state for some reason. I mean, maybe I'm reading that one wrong, but that's. Well, I just, I would just say there are a number of examples of that, but, yeah. you know, obviously there are number of guys who just stayed within the al-qaeda fold too so sure, it's not sure. it's not I, you know overall what i was thinking about this with with Olaki in particular what's interesting to me is um you know al-qaeda really hasn't had anybody who's been that successful since Olaki yeah. in terms of being able to translate their ideology and their belief system to an english-speaking audience and you know, there's a lot of you know discussion, especially in left wing circles, about killing Alaki and this whole idea that he's an American citizen and how dare you kill him without a trial and all this stuff, which I, I think is largely nonsense. I'm sorry. I mean, the guy wasn't going to turn himself in to be tried. He was o- openly part of Al Qaeda. I mean, he was publishing articles from his comrade talking about how they're proud to be a traitor to the U.S. He's undoubtedly planning, have a role in planning attacks, not just in inspiring terrorism, which he's openly advocating, but in planning them. I mean, he's clearly in the Al-Qaeda fold. We learned from the Al-Qaeda files, Bin Laden files, captured in Abbottabad, that they even, he was so senior at one point that even uh, Nazar al-Wahashi and others in Al-Qaeda in the Iranian Peninsula even suggested maybe he should take over as emir of the group. Mm-hmm. And Bin Laden turns that down and says, no, I, I'd rather stay with my aide de camp, which is probably a good, good decision, I would say, uh, by Bin Laden in that regard. Um, but, you know, this is a guy who was uniquely effective in all this. And I think we're fortunate that after he was killed in 10 years since, we haven't seen anybody quite as effective as right. he was. However, you know, ISIS evolved in a way and managed to, to adapt its marketing messaging without somebody like that. You had Abu Muhammad al-Anani, who was a fire-breathing spokesman for the group, who was killed a couple of years ago. You've had other sort of spokespeople for ISIS and their prolific social media machine. That whole game that they run um, has been very effective for them overall even if it's had some downsides. Um, but in terms of a guy who stands out like an Alaki type of figure, somebody who's fluent in English, fluent in Arabic, and can translate Islamic history through the jihadi prism, we haven't seen anything like that. Uh, no, really. no, that is that. That is amazing, Tom, that we haven't. And it's, it is fortunate because it was very disturbing um, to, to see a large number of Westerners, English speaking, you know, Americans, Brits, and and in other in other Europeans, obviously, um, to to flock to Syria to wage jihad. It just, you know, I mean, I I just I guess I I didn't expect I guess in ter- it. In, ter- when ter- it terms of, in terms just, of the Americans, I don't I don't even know that there are that many that went to 
ISIS in Syria and Iraq. I mean, you have yeah you some number. You had some also went Somalia for Shabbat. Well, but, uh, not just that, but the ones yeah. carrying out attacks here, right? You know, sympathizers, right, right. You know, providing funding. I, I, I meant to say gravitating to the Islamic State sphere more than yeah. Well, I would say it's it's, it's actually it's, it's it's an interesting topic. I mean, I don't want to get off on the whole thing, but you know, the FBI says they have you know had hundreds or even thousands of cases involving ISIS suspects or people who they think are going down that road. Um, and of course, most of those don't become violent uh, for one reason or another, or don't manifest themselves in an attack. And it's sort of an interesting thing when you think about the effect of all this. Yeah, I mean, you could say um, if you have had sev- more than several examples you can point to where it did have a, a negative effect. But beyond that, it's also caused this effect on counter ter- counterterrorism forces and intelligence and law enforcement, where they've had to basically interrupt a, a significant number of activity. Now, yes. a lot of times those guys may not be that much of a threat. Sometimes they are, you know, so it's tough to say. Um, in other words, it's, it's a very murky subject matter. It, it is. What, what the actual overall impact of these guys is. It, it, you know, we know there's an impact. That's not the question. The question is, you know, how many people did he actually influence overall? I don't I don't think we really know. Yeah, right. And, and you know, to, to that point, Tom, the – you know, not every jihadist is going to blow themselves up or walk into, a, you know, a store and shoot up people or a bit, you know, right. things like that. Right. Behind everyone willing to do that, you have a support network and there's formulas on that. It could be five for everyone. It could be 10. I don't know what the Islamic states, you know, how their cellular structure works or if it's very loose. But it's, you know, it's kind of the, you know, as we always talk about, it's the unknowns that always frighten me. If you have, you know, 20 Americans, 100 Americans willing to try or either, you know, conduct an attack here or in Europe or go to Syria, you know, how many more are in the wings behind that are supporting them that are, are, are quietly radicalizing or providing funding or sending equipment over things of that nature to, to provide support to jihadists? Yep. Well, I think we'll leave it there for this week. Sure. We're going to be back on schedule next week again to hopefully another episode. We have some guests coming up. Hopefully we'll we'll finalize them and get back to you guys and you can hear them on the show. We're going to try and bring some more guests on before the close of the year, have several more people come on and talk about different issues, uh, some of the complexity of all this. Uh, you know, I will repeat our call. If you're listening to the show and enjoying it, if you go give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that'd be great. It drives more people to the show. You can kind of... Tell people, look, these guys are don't really fit into your usual fare. They're a little bit different. Yeah, they're Americans and they're proudly Americans, but their views are don't really fit into any of the sort of policy or ideological boxes you're probably familiar with or probably heard about. Uh, at least we don't think we do. Uh, but on that note, I'll say thank you again for listening to this week's episode of Generation Jihad. Please do subscribe to the show. As a reminder, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else to listen to your shows, and we will see you again next week.